Hey, Mila Falcha, welcome to Irish Granny Tarot. It's time for our Saturday book, and ta-da! A New Science of Heaven by Robert Temple. Heaven being the skies and then some. This is a fantastic book. It's described as how the science of plasma will transform humanity's understanding of its place in the universe. Now, this book is about plasma physics. Let me preface all of this by saying I flunked physics six times. <laughs> used to be a great shame and now all I can do is laugh. And I used to say, Newton makes no sense. This stuff makes no sense. Well, guess what? Validation. <laughs> this is written by a scientist. Temple is, let me see, let me if I quickly tell you what he is. Blah, 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 blah. Oh, so he has studied astrophysics. He's been a senior specialist consultant to numerous multinational corporations, making significant contributions to the space industry. He's not coming from the fringe. He very much works with tons of Nobel Prize winners, and I really want to emphasize a few things about this book. This is the cutting edge of science. This is the direction science is going in the future. This flies in the face of mainstream status quo uh, belief. We've talked about this a zillion times. Um, science digs in to its professed facts when challenged. Historically, you know, they burnt people at the stake for proposing that the earth was round and just that, you know, humans were not the center of the universe. This book deals with the work of all sorts of really interesting Nobel Prize winning scientists, some of whom are still ignored, many of whom have had to be embraced by the mainstream as what they suggested has now been proven. This completely changes our understanding of our universe. And you might ask, why do this book? This doesn't seem all that re relevant to the kinds of books we've been doing like Dolores Cannon. If you remember about a year or so ago, uh, we did a book called Anzar the Progenitor and uh, by Dr. Bruce Solheim. And that book postulated that at some point, in the near future, if you looked at a continuum with physics on one end and metaphysics on the other, they were going to meet in the middle, that our understanding was going to uh, unfold. And this book heavily, heavily contributes to that. That's not boring. It can get complicated, and I've worked really hard to try to understand myself what they're talking about in order to summarize it in a digestible way. Um, it's nicely written. It's not a light read, but I would recommend the book anyway, even though you may have to take it in small bits and think about it. It's a lot. It is a lot. And I have skipped over some of the in the weeds physics explanations for old stuff uh, in favor of proceeding with his basic premise and getting to the whole point. So enough of me making excuses for how hard and how cutting edge and how fascinating this book is. Let's get into it. A New Science of Heaven by Robert Temple, written in 2021. And it begins with, uh, oh, with me saying that it has great narrative flow. It's very readable. It is very readable. Uh, 
this book, he says, is going to do more than just be a superficial review of uh, the the experiments and the ideas, the principles, the, what's the word I want? Theories. <laughs> the theories that he talks about. It's going to get into some of them. It won't just be superficial, but there's a point to it. And Denise and I are going to have a conversation you know, on YouTube, about this book. She's the one who suggested it, and uh, she was right. Yeah, of course. And we're going to have a conversation about it soon, as soon as she has energy after knitting her bone. Um, this book is so full of notes and references and bibliography and so many resources that his publisher refused to put them all in the book. It would have been 6,000 pages. So he started a website and you can refer to the website for drawings and photographs and uh, references, bibliography, all kinds of stuff. And there are also in the book footnotes. Um, it's www.newscienceofheaven, all one word, small letters.com. Newscienceofheaven.com. So that's where he put most of it. So this book begins in October of 2019 with an article on um, the observations of a Polish astronomer, uh, Kazmierz Kordeluski. A lot of these names are hard. A lot of these scientists have hard to pronounce names. So in 1961, Kordeluski, with two other Hungarian astronomers, uh, they were uh, Hungarian, he was Polish, saw something and described it and wrote an article about it. And that's the discussion that we start with. What they saw has become known as Kordeluski clouds. And just because I'm going to call them from now on K clouds. So it's Kordeluski clouds. And this motivated the author to write the book. This book is about plasma. Now, when I heard plasma, I have not, let's just say I have a complicated relationship with physics. It's not something that I particularly seek out. And when you say plasma, I think blood. And yes, that's a whole different use of the word plasma. In the context of physics, we have solids, atoms bonded together into molecules, and they're, they move, every all things in nature are ceaselessly moving, but they're moving at a slow enough rate of vibration and frequency that they stick together. It's a technical term. And if they speed up, for example, if you add heat, they spread out, they get more energy, they move farther, they become liquid. Think ice cube, water. And if you continue to add heat or some sort of energy, they move faster, they spread out farther, and they become a gas, steam. Well, the next step in the process, if you continue, is that the molecular bonds break and they become subatomic particles. So we're talking electrons, protons, and ions. They're no longer molecules. They're subatomic. So according to the book, plasma is matter made of incomplete or partial atoms, which are ions, and smaller particles, protons, electrons. It's the fourth state of matter. And because they're not whole atoms, they're not atomic, subatomic matter, but they are matter. So examples of plasma, some of this is kind of already page two and it's mind boggling. Some examples of plasma, the sun, all the stars, lightning, especially ball lightning, which I've never seen, but I talked to somebody who has, and it was an interesting conversation. We'll get to it. And other phenomenon, which we will get to. 
So plasma is usually invisible. Just think tiny, tiny particles, electrons, protons, ions, moving so quickly at such a high frequency uh, that they're really spread far apart. Our eyes are not equipped to see them. So after the sighting of these K clouds, Kordelewski clouds in the sky, uh, the, the author wrote an article and it, it, it's in the appendix of the book. So these K clouds are actually, let me talk about what they saw. Two giant clouds, each one nine times at least bigger than the earth in a system. In other words, affecting each other, the two clouds, the earth and the moon in a, an interactive system. And these clouds are located in a very interesting spot on either side of the earth and moon. The only two areas in that proximity that are free of gravitational pull. That becomes important. Now plasma, because of its nature, electrons, protons, ions, uh, is made up of charged particles. And charged particles uh, have what's called ordering properties. They behave certain ways because they have a charge. Uh, they're conductive and they're volatile and they form complex evolving patterns with each other and other matter. And this is true especially of what's called plasmoids which are bundles of plasma like the K clouds. They are plasmoids. So scientists pretty much agree 99% of the universe is made of plasma. Now, when I say scientists pretty much agree, 99% of scientists agree. The, the, the ones who would argue this are the ones who have tenure and chairs at universities, uh, whose reputation for 40 years has been based on other science that doesn't agree with this. So yikes, they're hanging on. Plasmoids, plasma can be called inorganic life. Now there's organic life and inorganic. Organic is carbon-based. Inorganic is not carbon-based. Doesn't make it any less life. Now that's one of the first concepts that I had to work on because I, when I went to college, <laughs> and I was a science major, when I went to college that wasn't really a thing. They did know the earth wasn't flat. I'm not that old. So this is inorganic life. It's alive and it can evolve intelligence. We'll get to it. So the author suggests that plasma had a role in forming the planets through it, the universe's long cosmic history and may even have helped create organic life. And there is substantial evidence to think about this. So his premise is that plasmoids are, are uh, life, but or inorganic. Uh, inorganic because they're not carbon atoms. Life is made of preatomic matter like uh, electrons, protons, and ions. Um, and when, it, when life is made of those things, that's a plasma. All living things arise from plasma. So this is a whole new way of looking at the universe. And although this is not in the book yet, I'm going to put this out here because I think it helps to keep this in mind. Everything that we assume to be true about the universe, the planets, astrophysics, the apple falling out of the tree onto Newton's head, everything we assume to be true is based on less than 1% of the universe. The other 99% is made of plasma. Matter as we know it, solid liquid gas, is less than 1% of the universe. So we're basing all of our premises, all of our theories, all of our received wisdom based on 1% of what exists. So plasma is primary. 
The organic state is secondary. We start with plasma. And he calls this, this is a lengthy discussion that's been going on in the scientific community. He's not inventing this, but he's giving it a label for the purposes of the book, and he's calling it the new science of heaven. But he says you have to remember that it's also very old. This idea has been supported by the ancients, like a guy whose name you might recognize, Aristotle. So they didn't have access to the mathematical measurements that we have, yet they were considering this theory of plasma and that it may be where we came from. And it's time that we stop dismissing ancient thought and reassess what we believe in general. Much of what we call spiritual is plasma. Now here is where metaphysics and physics meet. And try to keep an open mind. I think this is fascinating. When you're thinking in terms of spirits and light beings, think in terms of plasma. It's just a re uh, um, not rejection, but a leaving of the solid material, three-dimensional, and going into a faster frequency, higher vibration, starting to sound familiar. Metaphysics and physics meet in plasma physics. So many spiritual experiences can be explained by the behavior of plasma. We're going to get into it. It's fascinating. And this leaves religion untouched. He wants to make a uh, a real point of this. He says it's a false dispute to say that plasma physics undermines religion. There is no contradiction. It's all about semantics. Uh, it's not a contradiction. It's more of an explanation and it's an enlightenment. So chapter two, exploring the nature of plasma clouds and their energy. The author knew a professor, Fred Hoyle, who was a leading astrophysicist. He also wrote the sci-fi book, Black Cloud, about an intelligent cloud in space. And although he doesn't come out, this author, Temple, and say this specifically, what he implies in this chapter is here this, this famous award-winning astrophysicist, big scientific expert, who can't get people to listen to his theories and he puts it into a science fiction book and it's all about intelligence in space from inorganic material plasma. He says when we think of clouds we think of water vapor of course but he says it's not the same thing uh, it's using the word cloud in a completely different way because in order to have water vapor you have to have an atmosphere we're talking about things outside of the atmosphere. So how can they, these K clouds between, you know, on either side of the earth and moon, how can they exist in outer space without an atmosphere? And they are not the conventional definition that we have of clouds, water vapor. He says they're composed of some subatomic particles and dust. And the dust is floating particles in space. And he says float is not the accurate word, but we'll get to it. This is, we're building on our knowledge. And so stay open-minded about this. Explanations are coming. And as it's like learning the ABCs before you read Chaucer, you know, we're going to get there. Uh, I'm so glad I'm reading this out, talking about this out loud, because it really helps to redigest the whole thing. So once again, plasma is incomplete atoms, electrons, protons, ions, and electrons are negative charge, protons are a positive charge, and ions are a positive charge because what they are is an atom that has, in a balanced atom, the electrons and on the outside and the protons in the nucleus are equal. When one of the electrons goes spinning off, you now have a positive atom or an ion. It's not a complete atom, but it's an atom having lost an electron 
loses an, a negative charge, and it's a mathematical thing. It becomes positive. Whole atoms have the same number of electrons and protons, and physical matter is atomic. It's made of whole atoms, and they join together to form molecules. Uh, and the atom, I, <laughs> I just explained all this, the atom becomes an ion when it loses an electron. The nucleus, the center of the atom, is full of protons, and the electrons are spinning around in their little orbits around it. It's very much as above, so below. And it uh, looks like a picture of the planets going around the sun. And if one of them takes off for whatever reason, then you have an ion. Then you have a real need for this atom to join with another atom. They want balance. They seek balance. And that's how you end up with something like sodium chloride, salt. So FYI, charged dust particles, uh, one charged particle of dust out there in the universe can have 10,000 electrons sticking to it. Whoa. And now this is where he introduces the idea that 99% of the universe is atoms, uh, atoms, plasma. It's subatomic particles. It's random ions and protons and electrons floating around. And because they're charged, you know, think of rubbing a balloon on your head. You know, there's that, that static, you know. They're charged and they attract and they do things. They have certain behaviors. And these particles that are floating around randomly in space, they rarely form atoms. And as a result, atomic matter is exceptional in the universe. Hard, rocky planets are extremely rare. And because of the sheer number uh, of, you know, plasma things, uh, ions, protons, and electrons, he calls them primary. It's just, just they outnumber whole atoms, which he calls secondary. So let's talk about the sun. The sun spews protons and ions. Those are positive. And it fills the solar system with them. And they now know that we are constantly inundated by this river, or as they call it, solar wind, of positively charged particles. Every dust particle in the universe is bombarded with this. It goes everywhere. This, you know, these, these things eventually filter everywhere. And there's little tiny bits of dust, which we'll talk about in a minute. And they attract and they're bombarded, and they become charged. These neutral little clumps of dust become charged. And if they have the same number of electrons sticking to them as they do protons, they're neutral. So this is rare, very rare, and very transient. Uh, this wind, this stream, of positive charges coming from the sun constantly is overwhelmingly positive and uh, it'll have occasional little filaments of negative but they they're not important and these K clouds have negatively charged ions in them and it's not important to know about that uh, he tries to to leave out stuff that is really getting too much into the weeds. But that flow of negative particles, the, the electrons, that they're way outnumbered by the protons, but that flow is electricity. So the huge flood of positive particles is what he calls proticity, because you have negative electrons, electricity, positive protons, proticity. And this was a name um, from a Nobel-winning chemist, Peter Mitchell, who built a motor that ran on protons. Most, most motors run on electricity. He built one that ran on proticity, something nobody had ever done. And it's the word proticity is not in real common use and not well known unless you're an astrophysicist or a Nobel Prize winner. A lot of this stuff is cutting edge. So this flood 
of charged particles. It interacts with particles of dust inside the K-clouds and it, they form complex patterns. They have behavior and the behavior is enormously complex. Um, and it can be described by mathematical equations, but it cannot be described by non by uh, by linear equations, only by nonlinear. What does that mean? Well, it's way more complicated than two plus two equals four. Uh, everything in science has to be backed up by evidence. And one of the things that's used as evidence, if you can describe something mathematically, E equals MC squared. If you can do that, that's uh, oftentimes persuasive to other scientists that you've got, if you can show that's true, you've got something substantial you're working with. These K clouds are way more complicated mathematically. They don't show a direct cause and effect. So, you know, law of nature, cause and effect, law of the universe. Um, they show something even more complicated than that. But the way that they act, their behavior can be predicted. Uh, no, let me, let me correct that. Linear equations, cause and effect, can be predicted, but the K-clouds, because they're nonlinear, they're very, very complicated, they're unpredictable. It's like, if you have a choice to go right or left, you can kind of do a 50-50 thing and it's, it's not that complicated. But what if you have a choice to go anything 360 in all dimensions? Suddenly, it's getting harder to predict. So that's what we're talking about. And this is a feature of what's called quantum mechanics. And it's a feature of quantum mechanical supercomputers that are being developed. So one of the discoveries that they made that's in this book is that a lot of the work that they're doing on computers, and you know how well I understand computers, I can barely turn one on. But if I'm understanding this explanation correctly, the work that they've done um, confirms, in a computer sense, in a, in a micro sense, confirms everything that they think about what's going on in the universe. It's uh, as above, so below. And uh, the quantum mechanical super computers that are being developed are now being used, this non-linear difficult predictability and eminently complex feature of these clouds are actually being used to argue for a high intelligence of the plasma clouds. And we're, we're going to get to that. So quantum uh, computers carry information in, in what's called quibits. And they can do zero, one, or zero, one. I don't understand any of this, so don't worry. You don't need to understand this entirely to move forward in the book. But the very newest idea is quidditz, which is 10 values moving all at the same time, 10 or more all at the same time. And this is what quantum computers do. So you got regular computers, which are just really, really smart but you can kind of use linear math and you can say, okay, uh, cause and effect. But then you get into quantum computing, which is just so much more complicated and they do non-linear reasoning. And that's what your brain does. So this allows for the consideration of multiple unpredictable outcomes and unexpected influences. Direct influences are linear, cause and effect and they can be interrupted, changed, redirected. And this is the inescapable and fundamental uh, concept of cause and effect, linear, simple. The inescapable and fundamental uh, concept of non-linearity, this complicated quantum, multiple influences, multiple uh, outcomes, is a function of these K clouds. And the word, that, that term that they use to describe these K clouds scientifically is that they are dusty 
complex plasmas. Uh, let's see, let me, let me read this to make sure I'm understanding it. So science is so compartmentalized the way the bureaucracy of science is set up these days that a lot of this stuff is only understood by a kind of a compartmentalized uh, small group of scientists. It's not that it's not true. It's just not really even heard about or thought about by a lot of scientists. They, they stay in their own sphere of influence and they don't care about other stuff, which is really a mistake. So fine plasmas are used to deposit uh, circuits onto microchips. So plasmas are actually used in computer development. And there's big money in the semiconductor business and lots of corporate secrets. So as these scientific discoveries are developing, secrecy descends to protect money, of course. And that's one of the reasons why this is not more well known. Military and security secrets uh, come into play as well. Uh, plasma science uh, work suffered attempts at control by the Nazis, by the Soviet government, by the CIA, and this continues. And we're going to get into the little bit of the history of it, and it's really kind of alarming. Well, it's very alarming. So, chapter three, the brief history of plasma research. So, plasma as we said, is barely known to most scientists and virtually not at all to the public. But it's been researched extensively by Nobel winners for a very long time. 1879, William Crookes discovers the fourth state of matter. He called it radiant matter. And he discovered it while studying cathode rays, which is the name, hence the name. Cathode rays were rays of electricity, uh, which were subatomic particles. And he wrote that uh, matter is not just the movement of molecules, that matter is a mode of motion. Now, this seems kind of evident, self-evident to us now, but this is a long time ago. And uh, this was a new concept. Tesla, who invented AC, DC, not the band, the electricity, he wrote that he was inspired by the work of Crookes. And Tesla said that Crookes got him interested in electricity and Crookes was studying the spirit world. So this guy who discovered all these things about electricity, which was not well understood, was also into spiritualism. Physics, metaphysics, boom. Um, so in order to apply scientific techniques to psychic research, uh, he, he did that and he became a public hero for his bold spiritual research, which was derived from his work on cathode rays. So his scientific peers uh, made fun of him, but not Tesla. Tesla was a remarkable individual. I should really do a video on him. He is something else indeed. So the word plasma was first used in 1932 by the Nobel Prize winning American Irving Langmuir. He called it plasma because the way a charged gas carries electrons and ions reminded him of blood plasma, the movement. So you can picture that. That's where, where the word fits. He said, and this is prescient, he said that that plasma flowed in a way that seemed alive to him. And this was the beginning of plasma science. So the person who kicked off an interest, uh, identified and talked about uh, radiant energy, which became plasma, was a spiritualist. And the discoveries and theories that followed from this We'll just very, very quickly run through a few of them. Interstellar dust is charged and made from plasma. Planets and comets 
very possibly formed by the coagulation of that dust. In 1955, they created a plasma blob, a plasmoid, artificially in a lab. Ball lightning is plasma. That was discovered. In 1958, they uh, finally identified the existence of the solar wind, the flow of positive charges from the sun. And they now know that there are two kinds of solar wind. There's the slow solar wind, now I won't get into the numbers, and a fast solar wind, which is about twice as fast. So the sun rotates clockwise, and so it looks very much like a pinwheel or what's known as the Archimedean spiral. Archimedes being, you know, not just an owl. Okay, let's see here. And the spiral looks like that. That's what the sun really is. It's a spinning spiral with these charges shooting off of it constantly, some slow, some fast. And that kind of movement of charged particles creates a magnetic, a magnetic field. And there's a powerful magnetic field associated with this. This was confirmed in 1994 by a guy called Ulysses Kraft. And they discovered that the space between the Earth and the Sun is filled with this solar wind plasma. We now know it's everywhere. At the time, they didn't even know it existed. In 1958, they, the conventional belief was that outer space, out, outside our atmosphere, was a vacuum. Not true at all. In 1958, they discovered the Van Allen belts. These are two donut-shaped plasma belts around the Earth. So... There's stuff out there outside our atmosphere. In 1958, the U.S., uh, this is just a little aside, the United States government nuked the higher atmosphere to create an aurora so they could study the plasma. They put off out over 100 nuclear explosions, and there is a growing suspicion that this is related to the instability of our climate today. In 1959, they identified the magnetosphere, which is the plasma around the Earth that protects us from solar winds. Thomas Gold also studied uh, the universe as a continuous creation of matter. It's a scientist. But now we're getting very much into the metaphysics. In 1960, Northrup, who before he took over airplanes, <laughs> was he's a scientist, and Teller, Edmund Teller, they explained the Van Allen belt. It had been identified, now they explained it. In 61, uh, the Russians suggested that the plasma um, that we see out in the universe also exists inside living organisms. In 1962, a guy, I can't, this guy's name is really hard to pronounce, Wickrama Singh, that's all one word, said uh, his theory that uh, I can't read my hand right. Oh, ice grains. Okay. <laughs> that there are ice grains, that's what they used to call ice grains, in interstellar dust uh, that weren't really made of ice. They were made of carbon. Now we're getting interesting because we're talking about the presence of carbon inside interstellar dust linking plasma in the universe to organic life on the planet. And this is an accepted scientific fact since 1967. In 1963, there's the Pines theory. Um, about wobbles in the plasma at low temperatures. Some of this is like, okay. Uh, this is what you call quantum plasma physics. Uh, 
And this would later help explain some weird quantum phenomena, which we're going to talk about later. So just all we need to know about this is in 1963, they were able to observe these weird wobbles in plasma and associate it with metaphysical things. In 1963, Mitchell came up with the <laughs> chemiosomatic, chemiosomatic theory. Well, anyway, and this is the uh, the energy of biological system are based func uh, functions based on subatomic currents. So what, what does that mean? It's called vectoral metabolism and it describes the directions of energy usage in the body. This might start to sound familiar to some people. Uh, this eventually will be linked to things like acupuncture meridians. A lot of things, because of this plasma research, a lot of things have been proven. A lot of things in energy healing, we're going to get way into it, and, and it's fascinating. But this was the building block. This was the early foundation of them understanding. It's this chemiosmo chemiosmotic theory where the energy uh, inside biological systems are functions. So the energy inside of everything, biological, is the result of currents of plasma, subatomic currents. And so this theory talks a lot about currents of energy in the human body, animal bodies, on plants. And in 1972, Mitchell came up with the term proticity, then he made the battery. In 1978, he won the Nobel Prize for chemistry. These people are not lunatics. These people are not dreamers. These people are serious, serious scientists. Actually, really good scientists are, are dreamers. They're able to imagine. In 1982, Hill and Mendes uh, talked about the spokes of the rings of Saturn. And uh, there's pictures of the rings of Saturn have like these weird lines in them, like the spokes of a wheel. These guys discovered that they were plasma of charged dust and they clump together and they make these lines in the rings of Saturn. In 1986, a guy called Ikezi predicted that plasma could exist as Crystals. Now, crystals are complex structures. So we've gone from a few stray protons and electrons and a particle of dust to complex crystals, all related. Hiccups, sorry. These are called Collins crystals. Collins crystals. And uh, try to remember that because I will forget. So they could be formed by the plasma of dust particles, Remember we said they behaved in dramatic ways. This is one of the things they do. They form crystals. Well, what do crystals do? Crystals are not just pretty pieces of rock. Crystals have a purpose. I have this crystal here that I keep with my tarot cards. And it's, um, well, it's supposed to be an amethyst. I don't think it's like the greatest amethyst in the world. <laughs> but it looks like a lump of rock, right? Dead. No. Everybody who's into crystal healing, you're going to love to hear this. Crystals carry information. They may be slow. The movement may be slow, but they carry information. And each different kind of crystal has a different set of information that goes outward. So they store information, and this information is necessary for the evolution of intelligence and communication. And this was proven to be true, accepted by the scientists' community in 1993. In 1989, plasma manufacturers saw dust, and you know, uh, this has all got to do with computer creation. And they were having this issue of dust. And every time they'd clean everything out and they'd all be gowned up in hazmat suits and vacuum sealed rooms to build these computer circuit things. And they would be dusty and it was driving them crazy. And they finally realized 
This isn't stray dirt. This dust is being created by the plasma. So they used lasers to show they proved it. Plasma, random electrons, protons, and ions behave in such a way they form crystals, they create dust. So we're seeing creation coming from this plasma. This discovery showed that dusty complex plasma was unique. In 1993, they announced that uh, the whole thing about plasma was true. So these are not random spec uh, speculations by people who think outside the box. They think outside the box and then they prove it. They proved it. In 1997, there was the discovery of gigantic plasma rivers flowing beneath the surface of the sun. And we're gonna get into the structure of the sun and this may very well blow your mind. So the sun on the outside, these whirling spirals of solar wind shooting out positive charges with a few currents of negative charge. If you go through that, these through these jet streams of hot charge gases, which is the plasma flow, you get into what's called the photosphere of the sun beneath the surface. And there are more jet streams of hot electrons of charged gases and a jet flow near the poles of the sun because the sun has poles. And put together, this outside and inside is 257,000 miles total width. We're talking big. Now they know that, just file that away, we'll get back to it. Dusty complex plasmas have intricate internal structures of gases and liquids and crystals. The crystals are capable of liquefying. Anything solid can liquefy. You just have to have the right energy to make it happen. Just remember, solids are molecules bound together and energy and attraction. Attraction keeps them together. Energy helps them to move faster. The faster they move, they overcome those bonds and they spread out and they no longer eventually are solid. They become a liquid. Just remember, ice cube, water. All you're doing is giving energy to these bonds, and as the um, molecules move faster, they spread out and you have water, You they melt. Uh, so crystals can liquefy and the liquids can uh, crystallize. They can go in both directions. Uh, and they make the point that these dusty plasmas, they're ubiquitous. They're everywhere. They're around us, they're inside of us, they're up there, they're down, they're everywhere. And they're capable of forming self-organized systems. That's huge. Just this little throwaway line in the book. That's huge. They can form self-organized systems. Well, what does that? Life does that. That's one of the definitions of life. So this is a new way of looking at things. They have the, a behavior they exhibit is informed behavior, self-directed, and they can manifest by themselves. And this has been shown by experiments with plastic beads. And he really got into this experiment. The description was several pages long. My eyes started to cross. I got a bird's eye view in my nose. I was like, oh God, I can't. So trying to summarize it, they basically hit these plastic beads with electricity. And when they do that, they start swarming like bacteria. What? Because bacteria are, you know, alive and plastic beads aren't. So what's going on here? This lifelike behavior of inanimate particles seems to threaten our prevailing definition of what constitutes life. It's patterned clustering of microparticles, which is fundamental behavior in dusty complex plasmas, those column balls, uh, you know, the clustering together. They're also called, you don't care, but they're also called Yukawa balls. 
So they know that plasma is subatomic particles that creates its own dust, and this dust can self-assemble into structures. So it's getting very interesting. The plot and the dusty complex plasma is thickening. In 2017, this happened in our atmosphere. The atmosphere manufactures new particles spontaneously from the gases that are out there in the air, and these form clouds of combustible, combustible vapor. Um, it's like they're seeded and kind of related to seeding clouds to get rain. It's kind of the same idea. It, this accounts for more than half of global cloud condensation nuclei, these balls. Just let the concept flow over you. This, this formation is aided by ions and a positive charged plasma. And the important thing about this is they were able to reconfirm it, show it again in 2018, show it again in 2019. When you can start showing something over and over, uh, theory starts to become more plausible. And these cover 40% of the Earth in kind of a tropical troposphere band, these gases, this cloud. And this is not accounted for in modern global um, climate models. So predictions that we're making, they just ignore this. They ignore all this new research that they've proven and proven and proven. So they've got a climate model. They're making predictions. And this is all, I guess he said, this is in Nature magazine. All public climate change discussions are flawed because they rely on inaccurate models. From Nature magazine, um, in at least 2019, I don't have the exact date, he has all these things in his website. So... That should scare all of us, that these predictions and our understanding is based on flawed models. The models are created without taking into consideration the newest discoveries. And you can't detect this stuff with satellites. Um, NASA's trying to study this stuff. What's happening, what we're talking about here is formation of particles in the atmosphere out of what seems to us nothing. These plasma clouds in the atmosphere are creating particles and the particles are seeding atmospheric clouds. And this very much copies when they study plasma in a computer situation where the dust was, it's the same thing. The formation of particles by plasma out of seemingly nothing. In both cases, computer creation, our atmosphere, and out there, all of those cases, it's a clustering process. And these are both new discoveries, and they suggest that there's some universal process going on that we have yet to really define. And it's another way to get something out of nothing. <laughs> so there's this thing called baryon, which is a kind of a subatomic particle. And I'm going to go over this as fast as possible without getting bogged down. And another uh, word, well, it's helium-3. And they observed that it creates whirling vortices in fluid. Remember I said the, earth, the sun was a spiral? Well, we're looking at the same sort of situation in uh, fluid. And this helium-3 has what's called superfluidity. That means a liquid that can flow with no resistance. And in 1997 in Nature magazine, they described uh, baryogenesis, that helium-3 can be created by this process. And so this once again is uh, creating something out of nothing. So he, he asks a very interesting question. What is existence? If they can do that, if they can create something out of nothing, 
uh, what are we talking about here when we talk about existence? And so now we're, we're getting into ancient philosophy is what we're getting into. Okay, let me see. I'm trying to mark a place to stop. So there's this Russian plasma physicist called, as I mispronounce it, Vadim Saitovich. And he lived from two, 1929 to 2015. And he studied plasma. The Russians did a lot of study on plasma. And he found something that looks like life that can be produced in plasma uh, from charged dust clouds. And he identified this as inorganic living material. So the self-organization of dusty plasma shows lifelike phenomena. And self-organization uh, can happen. That means they, these particles are moving with apparent thought, with apparent plan. And this can be done by dissipation. Uh, energy brought into a chemical system can be dissipated, used up by production of something, a life form structure. And these are called dissipative structures. They're like Isolated islands of positivity in a sea of entropy, growing disorder, and they can become highly complex and self-organized. So this is what we find in dusty complex plasma. So the whole point of this whole page of notes is that the Russians were able to show that what they postulated about stuff being created in dusty plasma complexes like the K clouds, they can show it happened. It does happen. And they say that this explains the central role of life in the universe. This is a philosophical death knell for the mechanical universe of like Newton and those guys, the bane of my existence. Love to see him go down. <laughs> so in dusty plasma, the rate of dissipation that's using up this energy to create is high and there's a tendency to self-organize and these are open systems. They can take in more energy from the outside, use it up, create more. And this feeds the growth of complexity. And they figured out from this that these K clouds next to the Earth and the Moon are absorbing what's coming out of the sun. They're using solar energy to make stuff. The Russians also discovered voids in the plasma and, and, and you need voids for structure. Think about it this way. Look at inside your body. You've got your kidneys and your lungs and your heart, but they're not all, you know, attached to each Well, they kind of are by the omentum, but they're, there's empty space. So, you know, there's the, the lungs is your respiratory system, right? And and then there's empty space and you've got your stomach and your guts. And what they're saying is that structure is defined by the empty spaces around it. Interesting. So your body is full of voids and it lets your organs be distinct structures. So plasma is full of voids. As it increases in complexity, it starts developing an internal architecture. So this non-linear character, we're not looking at cause and effect, something simple that can be A plus B equals C. This is way more complex in dirty complex plasmas. It makes the self-organization of internal structures possible. Just take it on faith. <laughs> they're so complicated that they're not just making one little thing, they're making structures. And the interactions between these dust grains can be collective. They work together. And this is non-linear, dissipative, collective self-organization. So numerous plasma experiments are done on the International Space Station. You wonder what they're doing up there? This is one of the things they're doing. Dust clouds must self-organize. They fill themselves with clumps and internal structures. They have to do this to be stable or they'll be destroyed. So these K clouds have internal structures even though they're invisible. And the reason they're invisible, these particles are, they can't even be seen with a microscope. You have to have special stuff to be able to, to show that they're there. So there's that. Our eyes can't see them. The other thing is, they're not a solid. 
They're not a liquid. They're not a gas. They're a plasma, and they're a universal plasma. They're out there way separated from each other. So this starts to get interesting. They're so far apart from each other. How do they communicate? We'll get to it. But they are stable. They are in communication, and they are a system, even though they're spread out really, really far. I guess it's kind of like, think about an oil slick. It could go for miles and miles and miles, but it's still an oil slick, you know? So in plasma, these stable spherical balls, these clusters, um, are actually uh, a phenomena that they see in various sorts of astrophysical media. Hang on, we're gonna get to it. There are giant spherical cosmic clouds that form in interstellar space. So what they're saying is you're seeing way out in the cosmos, the same patterns of behavior and structures going on as they can do in the laboratory, as above, so below. And these things very quickly become complex and stationary. Plasma crystals inside dusty complex plasmas can spontaneously form. Now here's where it gets really interesting. They are moving around. Remember the sun moving around. They can spontaneously form helical structures like double helixes of DNA. They exhibit the features of organic living matter. This is huge, huge. Thermodynamics and evolutionary features are exhibited. So what does that mean? They're showing autonomy. They can function by themselves. They're showing evolution. They change and they grow. And progenity, they make other things. These are all the principles used to define life. And a lot of the information that they use is stored in these helical structures like our DNA. Whoa. So they're capable of what's called autopoiesis. That's reproducing and maintaining itself. This means that plasma structures are candidates to be called inorganic living matter. So I apologize if these things are getting repeated a lot to kind of drive it home because what he's doing in this book is he's, like I said, starting out with the ABCs and then in the next chapter he'll remind you of the ABCs and add, you know, cat and dog, hat and man, and in the next chapter we'll have sentences. And So so we do repeat, but it, it's helpful from, I feel it very helpful to, to reinforce this stuff. So do these helical structures store information and communication like our DNA? Are there seeds of an, are these the seeds of an alternative um, life form happening? And it's found that these helical structures can uh, split and duplicate at a very fast evolutionary rate. Organic life does that very slowly. So this suggests that uh, a new program for SETI, the guys that are sending out radio signals to contact UFOs, that a better idea would be based on these lab experiments that we may be facing the possibility of explaining the low rate of our evolution in organic life by investigating the possibility that inorganic life forms organic life. In other words, instead of looking for radio signals, we should be looking for something else, which we'll get to. These heli helical dust structures can replicate like DNA inside the dust clouds, build structures, and these structures compete for the incoming solar plasma from the solar winds, which they basically eat. And this happens extremely fast. It outpaces organic evolution by billions of years, and it's gaining domination. We are latecomers. So this new SETI program should stop looking for little green men. He said, we have gigantic intelligent clouds at our doorstep. Billions of times more intelligent than we are given their rate of growth and billions of times older than any organic life form on the earth. And then he asked the question, 
masters of the universe? Hard to know. Dust made by plasma becomes building blocks which become living bodies of self-organizing charged plasma entities. They recreate themselves. And he said, are we talking about angels? We're talking about evolved energy. Plasma people, like angels, they exist. We can't see them. They're diffuse. They're made of high vibrating energy. And they can pass through us without changing their shape. Ball lightning does that. Potentially, the inner internal structure of these clouds contain all the knowledge of our cosmic environment for the past four billion years. And it would be information on all people who've ever lived and all animals and plants ever. They are clouds with a consciousness too alien for us to comprehend. And I will end this video, video number one, here, because we're starting a new chapter. And I'll begin the next video and tell you about my friend's experience with bald lightning. So, back in a minute.